Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. You've been receiving prophetic proclamations since morning. And God's blessings will be enriched in your life in Jesus' name. You had the, youth, the children choir. My cup is filled and running over. You know it's from the Bible? And then the adult choir capped it off. His promises never fail. They will never fail in your life in Jesus' name. Let's rise up. Ask God to speak to you at this segment of the service. We've come to a solid moment. We need to hear from the Lord. And you're going to ask God that your heart is here. Let him really uh, fulfill the purpose for which he brought you here this morning. The entrance of his word that's proceeding from here will bless you and then reach you. It's his proclamation. His promises will are going to talk about this morning. They will not fail in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, we bless you because you're a blessing to us. We thank you in reciprocation for the Lord Jesus you've given on the cross for us, the word of life, the bread of life. Even as the word comes to us, Father, our hearts are prepared. Plant them within us and give us the grace to do that which you are challenging us today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. First Kings chapter 19. Turn there, please. In the book of First Kings chapter 19, I'm going to read from verse 11 all through to verse 18. In First Kings chapter 19, verses 11 all through to 18. And our topic, by the way, is the still small voice for a new beginning. The still small voice for a new beginning. In 1 Kings chapter 19, I will read from verse 11 all through to 18. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the winds, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. And it was so. When Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou there here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of Israel hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazel, to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abed, Abel Meholah, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that is kept the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay, and him that is kept from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which had not kissed him. Praise the Lord. These verses set us on what we are about to talk this morning. The still, small voice for a new beginning. At this point, Elijah was passing through a difficult time in his ministry and life. 
Elijah was dejected, rejected, and running for his own life. The thing that came on Elijah, because if you look at the complaints and the way he spoke in these verses, you will see a sharp contrast between him and the Elijah of old. The thing that came upon him was so overwhelming that it beclouded his vision as to accomplishments he had had in the past, which if any of us, any average believer had had, even one of it, will always be rejoicing from now to eternity. Remember, Elijah that is here now, dejected, running for his life and rejected because of the threat from um, Ahab's wife, Jezebel. Remember, that was Elijah at the peak of the wickedness of Ahab, the king of Israel. When no man dared confront him, Elijah approached the son of Tishbite and told him, at my word, there will be no rain except when I come back to speak. Elijah, prior to this, went to the desert environment of all places and was being fed by ravens morning and evening. They were bringing him food. At this point in time, Elijah, if he could not what his present situation had beclouded him from appreciating, he will remember that Elijah, at this point in time, had gone from that raven that was feeding him to the widow woman with one only son. And then he made a prophetic proclamation that a barrel of meal will not fail, nor the cruise of oil. And they sustained him all through. Elijah, at this point in time, it was the occasion the son of the woman died. And Elijah brought him back to life. Elijah, at this point in time, if you recall, went back to Ahab and confronted him again when Ahab was telling him you are the troubler of Israel. Elijah said, no, you the king, you are rather the troubler. Elijah set up a contest in the Mount Car on Mount Carmel and dealt with the 400 Baal worshippers there. Elijah spoke and water came down again on the people of Israel. At this point in time, you know, I'm telling you, accomplishments in the life of Elijah up to this moment in time. Elijah, when the rain came, he outpaced Ahab and went into the city even before the king was able to get back into that. Devil is a bad one. You know what he does? He comes to your lowest point in life. He wants to make you forget your salvation. He wants to make you forget whatever accomplishment. He wants to make you throw away whatever it is that has happened that was good and that God is no longer good. That was the voice Elijah was hearing at this point in time. It was a trap the enemy set for him. Thank God because our God is good. And that's why we look at what we are looking at. Go back now and see verses 11 and 12. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind and earthquake, you know, he will be expecting that God will come in a big manifestation, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Look at verse 12. Can we read it together? One, two, go. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, what? A still small voice. Satan was pushing him to the point he wants to destroy his life and ministry. And he laid a bait for him. But God's goodness came back to Elijah. And he came by way of a still small 
voice. I don't know what circumstances you are passing through. I don't know what challenges you are going through. I don't know the suggestions of the enemy that is there pushing you and telling you it's over with. There's no hope for you. I'm telling you, that still small voice still speaks. And it will speak to you this morning in Jesus' name. I said it will speak to you this morning in Jesus' name. You know, for Elijah, enemy brought all those challenges intending to destroy him. But what eventually happened, because of the goodness of God, he turned it around. All those circumstances and situations that enemy wanted to use to destroy him brought him to a position where he was able to hear that still small voice. And I'm sending you prophetic word. Don't destroy yourself. Don't give up on God. Whatever you are passing through, that still small voice, it will speak to you, you hear clearly, and have a new direction in Jesus' name. Look at the book of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, looking at verses 16 and 17. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. In verses 16 and 17, for which cause we faint not. Adversities that are coming upon us, don't give up hope. A man that gives up hope in life, his death is the next thing. For this cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish because of the things that are happening to us, yet the inward man, that's where the voice, the still small voice speaks to, the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, brethren, is for a moment. Keep on hanging out there. They work it for us a far more exceeding and the eternal weight of glory. They will work out for you today in Jesus' name. Just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He is coming. He will visit you in Jesus' name. Back to 1 Kings chapter 19. Always have your hand there. 1 Kings chapter 19. Let's see something remarkable. That happened to Elijah when the still small voice spoke to him. In 1 Kings chapter 19, look at it in verse 15. In 1 Kings chapter 19, reading there in verse 15. What did you see from the beginning there? And the Lord said unto him, what did he say to him? Go return on thy way. Stop there. That's all I needed. God is going to speak to you today. And he's going to tell you, go back to that your medical doctor. And you are going to see that that negative diagnosis, he will touch them and they will never be there again in Jesus' name. What will God speak to you today? He will tell you that worries and anxieties, the sources of them, go back to them again. Because you are receiving a fire to them. When you get back, they will all be gone in Jesus' name. He will tell you, go back, go back. That still small voice will speak to you today. Egyptians you are seeing, you will not see them again in Jesus' name. Return back, return back. Look at verses 16 and 17, and Jehu the son of Nimshi shall thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shepherd of abed Mona shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room, and they shall come to pass that him that is kept the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay, and him that is kept from the sword of Jehu shall Elijah slay. What is he saying here? You see, Elijah was expecting defeat. Elijah was expecting death. Elijah was expecting eclipse of his life, ministry, and whatever family he came from. But the still small voice was looking ahead. And looking ahead at a place Elijah had did not know. Elijah thought it was 
God was done with him, but he was now giving him a new commission and telling him, look up, look up, something is happening. This still small voice envisaged Elisha, his own successor, coming on the field. And Elijah was thinking he's dying. The still small voice was looking at Elisha, Elijah, who will pass the mantle to Elisha. And remember, Elisha was the one that will receive the double portion of anointing, correct? As this time, Elijah has not completed the double portion miracles. And the still small voice was telling him, go back, go back, more will be done. You are going back today, and more will be done in your ministry and life in Jesus' name. You don't sound like you believe me. I said they will be done in your life in Jesus' name. Be it unto you according to your faith in Jesus' name. Look at Micah, what you will tell your enemies. Micah chapter 7. Those that are writing you up, those that are writing you off and saying, no, he's done with, I know him, I've done that, um, they're taking everything, he's finished, he's a spent force. Micah chapter 7 in verse 8. Micah chapter 7, they are rejoicing over you. He says, rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, what will happen? I shall arise. You are rising today in Jesus' name. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. He will lighten your path today in Jesus' name. I am going higher, yes. You are going today. Thank you so much. You are bound to go higher, not going down in Jesus' name. You see, like Elijah, God wants you to come to a position. It's a lot of noise out there in the society, and people think serving God and connecting with Him is through this form of faith and then glorifying, fleshly glorifying activities. No, it's not. What is highly esteemed among men is abomination before God. He wants you to come down, connect with a still small voice. Elijah was in the cave. Earthquake and wind and everything, he wasn't there until he collected himself. Look at Psalm number 46 and see what God's prescription is coming to you. Psalm 46 in verse 10. He said, calm down, don't worry. It's not a publicity race or running up and down and talking and doing. No, calm down. In Psalm number 46 verse 10. 10, Psalm 46 in verse 10. It says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the hidden. I will be exalted in the earth. You need to calm down. You need to cool down. The Bible has not been edited. It speaks the same language. So even if modernity has made it possible, we can go to moon and come back at at an instance. Calm down. Listen, stay put, and let God visit you. You know, Elijah came to that point. He came to that point. And when God spoke to him, the difference was very, very clear. He gave him a new mandate. He gave him a new beginning, which was, is what we were talking about. The still small voice for a new beginning. After that instance, do you know Elijah collected back himself and Elijah was running from Ahab. If you flip over to a few chapters, just after that, things started warming up. Elijah went back to the same Ahab and confronted him on the issue of Naboth's vineyard. You remember that? He went to him and told him again, you've stolen this man's vineyard and killed him. God, dogs will lick your blood where you did that. He did it. What else do we notice about him? He outlived the wicked 
Ahab himself. Ahab died. If he was pursuing Elijah to kill him, but he was the one that died even before Elijah. Ahaziah the king took over from Ahab. Elijah also confronted that Ahaziah. If you remember in 1 Kings chapter 1, when Ahaziah fell down from the lattice, he went to the god of Ekron to consult. And Elijah said, what? Is there no God in Israel? You are going to die. You are not coming out from that bed. You are dying instantly. And they passed on. Remember before he passed on, Ahaziah said, send 50 uh, soldiers, go and arrest him with a commander. Elijah sent fire from heaven one, two, three times. The third one, the other man, the captain pleaded for his own life. Remember Elijah, after that new beginning, he was able to come over to River Jordan. You know what happened? With his mantle, he crossed over. A man enemy marked out to kill was the one that now went and passed over River Jordan. You are passing your River Jordan today in Jesus' name. Not just that. Elijah, when he finished passing River Jordan, he went to heaven in a blaze of glory. You will ascend heaven in a blaze of glory in Jesus' name. See what will happen to you. Isaiah chapter 51 is put down there. In the book of Isaiah chapter 51, look at in verse 11. Isaiah chapter 51 in verse 11 it says, Therefore, Looking at it, winding the clock ahead of time. Who tells you you are missing heaven? Who tells you you are going to die as a, a backslider? Who tells you you are going to end up as a non-entity? No. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy. Can we read the last together? One, two, go. And sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Today, somebody will be like Elijah in Jesus' name. You can imagine Elijah with sorrow, running away. But when the chariots came to take, take him home, he waved sorrow, anger, everything, mourning, bye-bye. Today, you wave everything goodbye in Jesus' name. It will happen. Amen? Three points. Number one, reconciliation that precedes a new commission. Reconciliation that precedes a new commission. Point number two, receptive persuasion into notable commitments. Receptive persuasion into notable commitments. When God persuades you and you are receptive like Elijah, then you are going to go into notable commitment. Finally, restfully, restfully putting on the nobleman's countenance. Restfully putting on the nobleman's countenance. You must change your character, change your clothing, change your thought patterns, change your approach to things, and now you put on the nobleman's countenance. Big victory will then be yours in Jesus' name. Let's begin with point number one. Reconciliation that precedes a new Commission in First Kings chapter 19, the book of First Kings chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. In First Kings chapter 19, verses 13 and 14, and it was so when Elijah had it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. In this point, we are going to see something remarkable. We're going to challenge us that there must be 
reconciliation as a foundation for a new beginning with God. You don't just jump in and forget everything and whatever it is and say, God, uh, talk to me. God, give me a new commission. No. If you look at what is playing out here, Elijah actually misspoke before God and he opened up what his heart was before the Lord himself. As he was running, the difficulty and challenges in his life have brought some baggages within him and even in the mountain he was now complaining and telling God, look at what happened, look at the point for which I'm running away, I'm the only person left, I'm the only prophet and they seek my life, I want to die, there's nothing about it again. Lord, is you that is the cause of the problem. But that was it. God now made his point and told him, no, look at it, look at it. I've even reserved up to 7,000 prophets as it were. What happened? Elijah humbled himself at that point in time. His response was now to humble himself before God as a condition that God will minister to him, as a condition for him to hear the still, small voice. God spoke to him. And it's always a pattern. If you look at the example of Job himself, when you come and you are down, maybe check your life. Are there things I've said that I'm not supposed to say before the still small voice becomes effective there must be that reconciliation there must be looking into your life to make sure that you straighten things out Job chapter 42 book of Job chapter 42 reading verses 5 and 6 in Job chapter 42 verses 5 and 6 he says I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear but now my eye see it thee. I have spoken, I have seen, I have been taken for granted. Now my ear, mine eye are seeing thee. Verse 6, can we read it together? One, two, go. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes transgression. Whatever I've done, when the pressure, God knows us with a frail mind, so you don't feel like, uh, he's, he's your father. You talk to him like that. I'm sorry, I misspoke. It was a pressure that came upon me. But he has brought you to that cave, that location, to make you, to melt you, to make you really speak out, because it's still small voice is wanting to come in and do something in your own life. We're talking about for the believer themselves. The same thing applies with equal force with unbeliever. If you hear and you are hearing me and you, have not born, you are not born again, you are not giving your life to Christ, God's expectation is that reconcile with him first. If when they, whichever prayer you are praying and whichever one we are praying for miracle in your life, God's main key point, what he wants from you is repentance. Things might be unfolding in your life, crises and critical things. They are pushing you to a corner where you are going to hear the still small voice that will give you a new commission, give you a new beginning. And today you will hear that voice in Jesus' name. Look at the example of the prodigal son in Luke's Gospel chapter 15 and see what played out in his own life. How God eventually cornered him and brought him to that still small small voice environment and spoke to him. In Luke's gospel chapter 15, reading from verse 11, from verse 11 down to 13, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of good that followed to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there, what happened? Wasted his substance with riotous living. Devastating living, gambling, whatever it is, he was bad. He wasted. The scripture con concluded by wasting his life in riotous lifestyle. It, it, this verse 
didn't finish everything. If you jump over to verse 30, you will see part of the indiscretion in life of this young man. When the senior brother came back and was complaining, are you in verse 30? He said, but as soon as this thy son was come, which had delivered, devoured thy living, devoured it with who? Her lords. You killed for him the fatted Calf. Not just riotous living with halotry, with every kind of uh, fleshly indulgement. This guy was out doing each and every one of them as it were. But now, what something happened? He was boxed to a corner. Look at verse 14. In verses 14 down to 16. And when he has spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Have you wasted all opportunities? Jesus has been calling you over the years. Is there a strange sickness that's come upon you now? You can't even know which way, how to handle it. Is there a lack of peace in your life? He said, when he has spent all, mighty famine, difficulty came upon him. God is boxing you to a corner to bring you to a position you are going to hear him. And he will faint have fear his belly with the husk that the swine did eat no man gave unto him. That's it. He wants to humble him. He wants to get him down. You see, many a time we think riches are already I have children. I have everything. I can meet my bills and I don't have anything to worry about. No. Your soul is still troubled. You will know you've not gotten that peace of mind. It's security you need. And you know if you die in that condition, hellfire and it's forever and ever. So that's where he was brought up. And look at verse 19, 17 to 19, the still small voice came in and when he came to himself, what does it mean? When God spoke to him in that difficult situation, he came to himself, he said, how many higher servants of my father have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger. You see the voice of the Holy Spirit talking. You can go back. You can retrace yourself. There's no liberty in sin. You are in bondage. Why not come out? I will arise and go to my Father. Somebody will arise today in Jesus' name. Backslider is coming back today in Jesus' name. It's open-ended. It doesn't matter. Even if people know what is the, it is out. You went out there doing Come back. This, this prodigal son was there. That's why we are reading it this morning. I will arise and go back and will say unto him, Father, I have seen it came seven and before thee. You can go back to God the Father. Say the same thing. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. God wants to get you to that condition. Plead with him. It's not just saying it. Verse 20 shows, and he arose. He arose. He puts it into practice. You will arise in Jesus' name. See, this still small voice is still calling sinners out there and calling them, come back. Come back to the Savior. Look at Isaiah chapter 55, reading from verse 6. Book of Isaiah chapter 55, reading verses 6 down to 13. Isaiah chapter 55 from verse 6. It says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he may. He is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and I will have mercy upon him. And to our God for he will abundantly pardon. His pardon is waiting for you there. Jesus already went to the cross and died. He doesn't need to go back again. It's all paid for. Come in faith and accept him. Say, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. Say it, the Lord. For as the heaven are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your 
thought, pleading with you, come back, come back to me. Come back, and I'm going to spare you. You will come back in Jesus' name. Point number two, receptive persuasion unto notable commitments. Receptive persuasion unto notable commitments. Commitments. Let's go back to First Kings chapter 19. I'm reading verses 12 and 13 only. First Kings chapter 19, looking at verses 12 and 13. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice, and it was so. When Elijah had that, had it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? As you read these two verses, we see something is happening here. God was on an outreach mission to Elijah. Elijah was going to a position of self-destruction, hopelessness. He was going out from the will of God to part of despondency. God has not given us the spirit of fear, no. But he was going towards that. And the spirit of God, you know, the way God was, he doesn't put burden on us. He is always the solution. So he went on an outreach mission to him and now was reaching out to him. And you see, the scripture was emphatic. He had a still, small voice. But the scripture never told us of any image or figure or individual that Elijah saw physically, correct? He didn't see anything. The still small voice. You know what he stands here? When he was reaching out to him, he was reaching out to his conscience. Speak to that conscience. Sometimes you hear things and it's God communicating with your conscience and telling you, no, don't do this. No, this is not the path. No, this is not the way. This is not how to handle it. And then Elisha had it, connected with it. The fact that he connected with that shows you the state of heart of Elijah. You see, when Paul said, hereby do I exercise my conscience to be void of offense towards God and towards man. That's exactly what we are talking about. As a believer, don't box yourself into orthodoxy. Whether it's in the Bible or not, whether the word of God says or not, this is how I want to do it. When God wants to remind you about what he's spoken, your mind is blocked from him. Elijah, still small voice, came to him, spoke to his conscience. And because he had a receptive conscience, then he opened up unto God. And that's all God needs for a new beginning with whoever wants to be beginning afresh with him. It's a matter of your conscience. Look at Titus chapter 1. The book of Titus chapter 1, reading verse 15. In Titus chapter 1, in verse 15. 15, it divides human, human beings' conscience into two, as a matter of fact. Look at it in Titus chapter 1, verse 15. And tell me where your conscience is. And that's what you are going to be receiving when the still small voice from God comes. If it's on the other side, you will rebuff it. If it's in the positive side, it will receive it. Are you in Titus chapter 1, verse 15? Unto the pure. All things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit ministering, coming, but your heart, you don't want, you knock him off and say, No. 
Elijah at this point could have raised a lot of contrary arguments and knocked off all God is saying because he was facing a reality. Jezebel threatened him. They have the muscle, they have the power, they can effectuate what they were threatening. He could tell God, no, no, you, don't, you are mistaken what you are talking about now. He exercised his conscience, void offense towards God and towards man. And then he was able now to connect with God himself because he saw that this voice is the real one. And the Spirit spoke to him and ministered to him directly. But going round and round on this because a lot of us have lost our blessings based on this issue we're talking about. The Spirit comes and you hear it and it's challenging you. The Bible is read to you as to what God is saying. You feel, no, let me take my tradition. No, let me be an, of Adam's heart. Elijah could have swung out there. People that even had Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, you will see the nature of the conscience they had, they refused to hear. Look at John chapter 8, book of John chapter 8 in verse 9. John chapter 8 in verse 9. I would have read more, but let's just pick that and see the application here. In John chapter 8 in Verse 9, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they, 8 and 9, I'm reading 8 and 9, and they which had it, being convicted by their own what? Conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the elders, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the Missed opportunity confronted with their transgressions, sort of confessing. They said, No, let's just drive our way out. Remember the other one in Acts chapter 28, when Paul arrived eventually in Rome and called the Jews together and was speaking to them. At the end of ministering to them, a lot of them bolted out and said, No, we are not taking this. And he said, Well, God said it in hearing, you will hear. In obedience, you will not obey. You hear, speak to them. They've closed up their ears from hearing from me. You are different. You will hear from the Lord in Jesus' name. I say you have a different thought. You will hear from the Lord in Jesus' name. For Elijah, it was an impossibility. Physically, but because he had the same small voice, he believed God, and then at the end of it all, you will see that it eventually happened as God prophesied. And I'm pleading with you, whatever you are going through, forget what circumstance and situation is playing out. Hear the voice of God today, and the turnaround will come unto you in Jesus' name. Whatever your situation is, as the Lord speaks, hear him, and then things will turn around for you in Jesus' name. I remember a story about uh, Christian assemblies, brethren, we come together, in, and when they feel that um, excitement is no longer in their midst, maybe a night vigil, ordinary fellowship, and some people are tuning off and maybe trying to get distracted, and they will start off a song. The Lord has something to say. One person will sing it, the other one will say, yes, the Lord has something to say. Say it. And then the other one will now respond and cite a Bible reference and read it out. And they will all claim it and go to God, believing God. That's the dramatic sketch of it. But this morning, as I'm telling you, the still small voice spoke to Elijah. God also has certain specific things he wants to speak to you at this point in time before we finish up with point three. Number one, when you are in challenging times, God is speaking to you and telling you, I have divine supplies that will carry you through. Divine supplies for 
challenging times. Look at the book of Isaiah chapter 13. Specific promises is getting out to you today. The Lord is speaking. The small, still small voice. And when we get through each of them, about seven of them, you are going to see that they would have affected one word, the other, the situation and circumstance around you. Take them as the solid word of God. Promises is living for you. And then go out and you see a change will come in your situation in Jesus' name. The Lord has something to say. Number one, divine supplies to you during challenging times. Isaiah chapter 30. In the book of Isaiah chapter 30, reading verses 20 to 23. Isaiah chapter 30, reading from verses 20 down to 23. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. But thy eyes shall see thy teachers. Look at verse 21. Can we read that one? Just 21 alone. And thy ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way. Walk in it. When you turn to the right hand, and when you turn to the left, that's what he's promising you. He will do it in your life in Jesus' name. He will hear that voice that says to you, this is the way, this is the way, go there. From verse 22, I'm reading now. You shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver and the ornament of thy molten image. All those false gods you are relying on, you will cast them out. Thou shalt cast them away as a menstrual cloth. Thou shalt say unto it, get thee hence. No, I'm looking unto God they go alone. Verse 23 now comes. When you do it, then shall he give the rain of thy seed, that thou shalt sow the ground with all, and bread of the increase of the earth, and it shall be fat and plenteous. In that day shall thy cattle feed in large pastures. That day has come for you in Jesus' name. The Lord has something to say. Number two, he's saying something. Assured security in the Christian race. Assured security in the Christian race. People are backsliding here and there. Even leaders and people don't stand there again. They want, don't want to walk the narrow path. Look at me, my little self, where I am. Am I sure I am going to make it to the end? The Lord has something to say. John chapter 10, verses 27 to 29. John's gospel chapter 10, reading verses 27 to 29. Everybody go there, please. John chapter 10, from verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and know me. I know them. And then follow me. You will hear God's voice in Jesus' name. He will speak in that still small voice. And when they hear, verse 28, and I give unto them what? Eternal life. Already, when you hear and take it, and they shall never perish. You will never perish in Jesus' name. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Can they pluck you from there? No. Secured. Secured. It's just, it's so up to you what you do with your Christian life. As far as you're obedient and following the Lord, he said you are secure. Stay there. Number three, the Lord has something to say to you. Number three, promise of divine companionship divine companionship whether in the fire or flood anywhere you are whether you are enjoying or not wherever the promise of divine companionship if if he's there with you what will happen nothing he will take care of situation hebrews chapter 13 see it point blank because i'm showing you scriptures 
what God will speak to you. When the enemy is speaking contrary and saying, well, God abandoned you and this one, because his word liveth forever. Look at what he's telling you. Hebrews chapter 13, reading verses 5 and 6. Hebrews chapter 13, reading verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, what is he saying to you? I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. What is he saying to you? I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. It shall be so for you in Jesus' name. Because he has spoken it, you are now speaking back with assurance in verse 6, so that we may boldly say, what will we say? The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Get hundred Ahabs, hundred Jezebels, let them pursue you from here to eternity. You will not fear in Jesus' name. Fear will not come into your camp at all in Jesus' name. The Lord has something to say. Say on. Number four, promise of handling your adversaries promise of handling or dealing with your adversaries, whatever it is. God's promise is very clear. You don't need to spend time on planning to counter-attack people. Shut your mouth. Whenever they, even, they want to speak down on you, keep quiet. God takes over your battle. Let them gang up and do whatever they are doing. Just face your assignment of living righteous before God and carrying on the ministry has called you to carry Leave the rest to him. He will take care of them. Isaiah chapter 54. I am going to read verse 15. Isaiah chapter 54 in verse 15. Isaiah chapter 54. Reading there just verse 15. In verse 15. Behold, they shall surely gather together. It's reason. They will come together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee, what will happen? Shall fall for thy sake. He didn't say gather back against them and fight them. No, spare yourself the energy. All he needs is just keep walking with him. Keep hearing the sound of the small voice, still small voice. Like Elijah, he didn't organize an army to fight back against Jezebel and Ahab. He just had that voice in the cave. The voice that came as still small voice and said, go back. That's all he needed. And God's companionship went with him. All their gang up and everything God was able to deal with them. He will deal with the same for you in Jesus' name. God has something to say. Number five. Correct? Yes. Divine healing and health. Divine healing and health. We are living in this. Don't depend on medical science and advancement. Many a time they fail. And technologically medicine has come a long way, much more than ever in human, in known human history. Yes, there are strange sicknesses that are coming over women the medical field. So you will always know that God is a God of all flesh. He's better than the physicians that are out there to just help you. He gives a perfect cure. And look at the blueprint in Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15 in verse 26. The promise of God for you. If you're going through challenges, physical affliction, spiritual ailment, emotional or whatever it is, infirmity of the flesh, he is telling you, my blueprint still works. That still small voice is reminding you. Look at it in Exodus chapter 15 in verse 26. Are we there? Turn your Bible. Some of us, we need to sit up and look at the Bible as we are reading. Exodus chapter 15 in verse 26 and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his status. How many of us are ready to abide with this? Can you raise your hand up? All these conditions, you are ready, correct? 
beautiful. He said, when you do all these things, hearken to his voice, do what he commands, give ear to his commandments, keep his status, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. Why? For I am the Lord that he led thee. In the confines of your home, when the enemy is suggesting to you, this sickness is unto death. It's in your family lineage. This sickness, you can't survive it. Look at the prognosis and diagnosis from the medical the battle is won and lost in the mind. That's summary of what I'm telling you, brethren. Elijah's remarkable turnaround was because he changed the mind per se. He had the still small voice speak to his conscience. And that's why people get remarkable, miraculous turn around. When he speaks to that heart and tells you this is it, that's what he's saying here to you in point blank. God has something to say. Number six, he is saying to you, I can carry all your burdens. Bring them to me. I am your burden bearer. Whatever it is, news from far location concerning situation in the family is so distressing and there's nothing. News in your workplace, news from your to any source, wherever it is, whatever that upsets you and the burden to you, he says in Matthew chapter 11, bring it to me. Matthew's gospel chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. In Matthew chapter 11, he carries all your burdens without an exception. Matthew chapter 11, verses uh, 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. What will happen? I'll give you rest. Rest of the Lord is coming to you today in Jesus' name. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart and shall find rest unto your soul. You shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Three days. Enemy lose you with a lot of burden. Remove them. Jesus says as many as receive him, he gives them power to be the children of God. Contrast it. Israelites in the land of bondage, they were using kind of forced labor that is manual in every sense of it. Contrast it with Jesus in the New Testament, the technology he gives for the same labor that is much more. That's using physical things for comparison. Jesus said, my body is light, my yoke is light, and my body is light. My yoke is easy and my body is light. Come unto him. Finally, the Lord has something to say. That's in Revelation chapter 3 in verse 8. Revelation chapter 3 in verse 8. Eight. Do I tell you this? I think let's read it and then I will tell you because it's so clear, it's so fulfilling, it's incredible in its own nature. Revelation chapter 3, look at it in verse 8. I know thy work. He knows it. He knows what you are passing through. Behold, I have said before thee what? An open door. No man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my words, and hast not denied my name. In other words, you cannot outcompete them, people of substance in the world. I know you, you don't have much strength. But in the midst of it, I've set an open door before you. Not by any man. When God says an open door before you, nobody can shut it in Jesus' name. This number seven is open door for incredible blessings. Incredible blessings. Doors that are open wide for your profession, for your business, for your family, everything, whatever it is. 
open, open doors in Jesus' name. That's what the still small voice is speaking to you. Accept it by faith. And turn around, we come to you in Jesus' name. Finally, let's cap it up. Restfully putting on the noble man's countenance. That's point number three. In point number three, I'm going back to the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 15 down to 16. From verse 15 down to 17. From verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shephard, of Abel, Abel Meholah, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escaped the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay. And him that escaped from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Brethren, something wonderful is happening here. And this holds the key for the remarkable turnaround for Elisha himself. Remember, we are tracing the story of him and the encounter. We told you how he repented. Now at this point, we are seeing a cooperating Elijah with God. When the still small voice spoke, and he was receptive to that, now he now gave him the scope of his renewed commission. Beyond himself, up to Elisha, his own successor. And he laid this in sequence and said, if the sword of Hazel escapes this man, Jehu will kill him before Elisha himself will take care of them. Suddenly, it dawned on Elijah that he's, a, he's an important piece in God's program to fulfill God's mission here on earth. It suddenly dawned on the man that I am putting up the garments that says failure, not wanted, death as discouragement, but God has a noble man's attire for him. God's program is dependent on his walking with him and then walking along the tasks that God needed for him to do. It was all God needed, a change of heart, a change of attitude, a change of behavior, a perception that is quite different from what he was having out there. And the same is what God is looking unto you to find out. Don't say, I'm just a little person in that corner in the school, in that corner in my place of work, in that corner in my country, my people around. No, God has a purpose for you. If your enemy is trying to suppress you and bring you down, look up like Elijah who caught the vision of what God was sharing for him and he knew he was an important part of God's program for his life at that point in time and he moved out. You will move out today in Jesus' name. Look at all the remarkable characters in the Bible. Essentially that's what we're talking about. When the still small voice speaks to their hearts, if you know their present situation was kind of nothing is going to come out of it, but they believe God and things turned around. You believe God today and things will turn around for you in Jesus' name. You need to speak to yourself. You need to tell yourself, believe God. Believe his word. Believe this still small voice and that's all God needs. The future will be brighter for you in Jesus' name. Pick somebody like Abraham. Look at Romans chapter 4. As we are going to Romans chapter 4, Abraham was presently, we, re, we rejoice in being associated with him as a father of the faith, of the faithful. We see him as a towering figure that was in they filled up in good riches in cattle and silver and gold. Where did he begin? It was nothing except that still small voice. It came, it came to him. And when it came to him, he believed God. Look at Romans chapter 4. 
Because he accepted it, he changed his attitude, he changed his position, and then the end was that things turned around for him in a remarkable way. Romans chapter 4, reading from verse 17 down. Romans chapter 4, in verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead and called those things which be not as though they were. When he spoke to him, there was no child. When he spoke to him, he said, Father of many nations, and he believed. Verse 18, who against who? Because his still small voice has spoken to him. Just like you are hearing from this small, that all the while we were here. Who against who believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy side be, thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's... You see, things he eliminated because he has had the still small voice. Verse 21, and being fully persuaded. Somebody will be persuaded today in Jesus' name. Being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Can God do the same thing for you today? Yes. yes. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteous. God sealed it because it was clear. Now it was not written for his own alone, that it was imputed to him. Can we read verse 24 together? One to go. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, was delivered for our offense and was raised again for our justification. Not just for Abraham, he's a historical figure gone, but for us also that are here. When the enemy is pushing you to a corner of despondency, rejection, and then the people don't greet me, they don't like my face again, they didn't create you. Forget that. They don't, miss, they don't understand you. That's their perception. It's not your problem. And it's not why you will want to push yourself to go and harm yourself or start bearing grudge. No. Well, there is a purpose for you in existence at this point. And God's purpose is what the still small voice is speaking to you. Pick somebody like David. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17, in verse 29. 1 Samuel chapter 17, in verse 29. Turn there, please. In the book of First Samuel, chapter 17, in verse 29. I'm reading there. Verse 29 says, And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Some of you are wondering. Are you seeing it? And David said, What have I now done? Is there not he was actually responding to one of his brothers that we are kind of castigating him, berating him. You come here, I know how pompous your heart is. That was at the time Goliath of God was out there challenging the people of Israel. And David now turned back to the brother and said, is there not a cause? Why did David say that? Remember it was Goliath that opened up the ministry of David to blossom so much when he took him down. Why did David respond that way? God already spoke to him in his, by still small voice telling him there's a Goliath that must be brought down. David, you have been brought here to bring down that Goliath. And he told the brother, is there not a cause? I have a ministry. 
Can you, at a point, come to those persecuting you and telling you, walk up, you are do, being too serious. Go back out of the narrow way. Tell them, is there not a cause? If I drop it, who will save these other people? I need to stand firm and be telling them that Jesus is good. Is there not a cause? Why would I walk out of this <clears throat> kind of arrangement that uh, God perfectly fitted me into because of little storm here and there? Is there not a cause? You will remove every Goliath in your life today in Jesus' name. Paul himself, remember Paul the Apostle. Paul was heading to Jerusalem. And they were persuading him, don't go, don't go, don't go. Look at Acts chapter 21. When you see that God speaks to you and he has told you this is what will be accomplished. Nothing, no obstacle of the enemy can stand on your way. You move on and accomplish that which God has made available for you. Acts chapter 21. Let's see the example of Paul the Apostle. You see, when the still small voice spoke to him, he came to at an encounter with a difficult situation and circumstance, and Paul made up his mind that he's not going to back out. Acts chapter 21, are you there? I'm reading from verse 10. Acts chapter 21, verses 10 to 14. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's garden and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus say, said, Thus say the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at where? Jerusalem. Bind the man that owned this garden and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we had these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered them. What did he answer them? What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we will not persuade, when we could not be persuaded, we see saying, the will of the Lord be done. We're talking about still small voice. Conviction that David or uh, Paul re received. Where did it begin? Remember in Acts chapter 9, when on his way to Damascus, he, the Lord encountered him. Remember Ananias was sent. And Ananias was reluctant. And God said, no. He is a chosen vessel of me to stand before kings and the Gentiles. Now he was heading to Jerusalem, and the apostles were telling him, No, don't go, don't go. But he remembered that still small voice. Rome was the ruling empire in the whole world. And if Paul had aborted this trip to Jerusalem, there's no way he would have stood trial and then appealed to Caesar in Rome. That resulted in Paul going to Rome, a more expansive ministry in his ministry, adding more to what he even could accomplish if he had backed out. You will not back out in Jesus' name. I say you are not backing out in Jesus' name. Because that still small voice is still speaking, speaking, speaking. He spoke to Jeremiah when he told him, I'm a child. He said, no, don't say you are a child. Stand up, stand firm. I've made your face an adamant one. Stand before these people and repel them. You will stand, you will overcome in Jesus' name. That's the final prompting from this still small voice unto you. Wherever you are going, this is the Lord's kingdom. This is the Lord's word. The Lord created it. It is your father. Never be overtaken by any fear of anything, limitation of anywhere, and then be operating in morbid fear. Romans chapter 8, that's the parting scripture I'm giving to you, and we go to God in prayers for you to know that that still small voice wants you to plant this in your heart at all times. Hold 
all to it. Whatever you are facing, whatever it is, always remember this is what God wants you to take home. And if it's happening, you will know. And if you believe that, you know that eventually, whatever it is, it will come to pass. You will overcome. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 31. Are you there? Everybody, some are still flipping their Bible. Romans chapter 8 in verse 31. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. That's our pattern scripture today and we go to God in prayers. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. Are you there? What shall we then say to these things? What am I adding more? As preach all I can preach. We've uh, talked about Elijah. What again do you want to add? If God be for us, who can be against us? That God is with you. Nobody, nobody can be against you in Jesus' name. That still small voice that started speaking to you will keep speaking to you. Take this way. This is the way. And the sheep of the Lord hear my voice and they will not follow the voice of a stranger. That still small voice will open up new beginning for you and you will accomplish all God has for you on earth in Jesus name. Rise up and let's go to God in prayers and ask God to establish all these promises in our heart. Believers doubt I'm able to do these things. Believers doubt that I'm able to visit you and open you up to a new beginning. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Talk to the Lord and say God I believe. God I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Whatever it is the still small voice is still speaking. Speaking speaking to you and is speaking and urging you to a new beginning a new beginning that will overpass whatever you have done in the past a new beginning that will open up doors of opportunities like you never have had before. The Lord is about to do something. Something remarkable in your life. Something remarkable in your ministry. Forgetting the past. Paul said, I press forward to the mark of his high calling. I'm moving forward to higher level. Moving forward. Moving forward. You are going forward. You are going forward. Not backward. Not backward. Not backward. You will keep moving on. You will keep moving on. You keep moving on. Open up yourself. Elijah exercised his conscience to be void of offense towards God and towards man. And that was why he was able to hear from the Lord. Uh, you, when last did the Lord speak to you? When last? When last did he speak to you? You are disconnected from the Bible. Go back again. He speaks. He speaks. He has spoken to us different seven scenarios and they give giving us assurance. He is our Lord. He is giving us assurance. He is there for us. He will give us divine supplies during challenging times. He has spoken to us. He has spoken to us. He has spoken assuring you security as a believer till the end. My sheep hear my voice. The voice of a stranger they will not follow. And I will keep them and give them eternal life. No man can pluck them out of my hand. Promise of divine companionship. He will say I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. Do you believe that? Tell God that divine companionship walk with me. Walk with me O oh Lord. Walk with me till the end. He will Will handle all your adversaries, all the adversities in your life. They will surely gather, but not by me. They will scatter. When they gather, I will scatter them. The Lord will scatter them entirely. Oh, promise of divine healing and health. Divine healing and health. The still small voice is telling you, I am the Lord that healed thee. I am the Lord that healed thee. Not your medical doctor. I am the Lord that healed you. Not advancement in medicine. I am the Lord. I am the Lord that he led the wholesome healing, body, spirit, and soul. He will heal you. He will heal you. He will heal you. He will heal you. Are you hearing the sound of the voice of the Lord? The still small voice. He wants to carry your bodies. Casting all your cares upon him, for he carried for you. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Come back unto me. I will give you rest. He will do it. Oh, 
open doors. Behold, I've set an open door before you. No man can shut it. No man can shut it. Jezebel tried it on Elijah. He couldn't walk. Elijah prophesied how she would die. She eventually died that way. She couldn't execute her enterprise against Elijah. Why do you think God has changed? He never will change. No. I have opened doors of opportunity for you. No man will shut them. No man will shut them. In Jesus' name we pray. Brethren, we necessarily have to close and then swing into the communion service. But then, we've been challenged enough. It's still small voice, still space. Harden not your conscience. And it will take you to higher heights in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we are grateful unto you for the power pouring of your word upon our hearts, especially challenging us concerning the still small voice. Elijah had it. There was a new beginning in his ministry. Today we are hearing it, O oh Lord, and we are pleading with you. Begin afresh with us in Jesus' name. As many as are coming back to you in repentance, maybe during time of pressure they misspoke. They acted in a way that was not advised Lord, even as Elijah, who humbled himself, faced with the raw statistics about your goodness unto us. Father, accept them back in Jesus' name. Those that are outside the fold and they are coming back crying, even like the prodigal son who said, I will arise. And they followed up in arising, Lord, get them restored back in fellowship in Jesus' name. Grant them also the salvation of the Lord in Jesus' name. Looking unto the future, O oh Lord, we commit our hearts unto your hearts. The same grace you gave to the apostle Paul and the earlier disciples, Father, to exercise their conscience, to be void of offense towards God and man. Lord, we will exercise our consciences and will be hearing from you in Jesus' name. The challenges, the good things, the promises that the still small voice will bring to us, especially during times of affliction, Lord, we will grab them, we will hold to them, we will believe them, and they will work for us in Jesus' name. Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, no evil shall come upon us. You will uphold our hands, O Lord. This heavenly race we are running, we will run successfully till the end in Jesus' name. Father, I bring your people before you. Another week begins, so Lord, begin afresh with them. As you are commissioning us with a voice and a still small voice, speak to each and every one of them within the week. The program you have for them in the church, in your ministry, in the kingdom. Lord, everyone will be clearly knowledgeable about what you have for them in Jesus' name. Your angels will guide them through all the places they are going within the way. And Lord, if Jesus studies and we come back next week, they will come up back with the enhanced testimonies of your goodness in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, because you've done it. Even beyond what we have asked you, we bless your name, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And the saints said, Amen.